I just want to do God's will. What you're seeking is a blessing from God. You must expect a miracle. You have the power of choice. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Life Today Live. Randy Robinson here. I have a question for you. Have you ever worked with people? Uh, have you ever been in a situation where you had a, a team, a, a group of people? You have to accomplish something together, whether it's in a church, in a business. Uh, those would be the most common ones, but I mean, it could translate down to, I don't know, your kid's sports league, whatever. There are some things that make it very difficult to work with people. Uh, and I have I have seen these things. I have probably been guilty of some. I know I've been guilty of some of these things that that destroy your your team uh, and make it hard. And so we're going to talk about some of those. This will be very, very practically helpful to you, I think, for wherever you're at. Now, the title of the book that we're kind of bouncing this off of is Saving Your Church from Itself. Uh, and as I was telling today's guest, Chris Songson, before we started, I was looking through these things and I was like, okay, when I was in a secular business, a Fortune 500 company, I, I saw most, if not all, of these six behaviors <laughs> that were very destructive. And I was actually guilty of at least one of them. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll own up to that today, maybe not, but regardless, you're going to get some help. So I appreciate you being here. If you haven't subscribed, followed, liked, I invite you to do that now. And now to our guest, Chris Songson. Great to have you here on Life Today Live. Oh, man, it's my privilege to be on here. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it, Randy. I'm, I'm a little bit curious about where this book even came from. Uh, is, and, and, and so give people a little bit of background of, of what you do, both with churches and corporations, so they understand that you're not just, yeah. this is not theory. <laughs> you, you've, you've lived this. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, thank you so much for letting me be on the show. And uh, it's, it's an honor. Yeah, the book, uh, although it says saving your church from itself, isn't just for churches or church leaders. Um, I title that and the publishers want to title that because they know my audience is very large to pastors and, and leaders. But it really does go across just all relationships. But uh, in answer to your question, I do a lot of uh, speaking and coaching in church past, church world, pastors, leaders, that type of thing. But then I also do a lot of speaking and leading and, and some coaching for very large corporations, Verizon, Home Depot, Hilton Hotels, things like that, uh, where I've done a lot of speaking. And in the speaking and coaching, what I've noticed over the last few years, um, especially, I've just noticed a couple of things, Randy. One is... I've noticed regardless of what audience you're speaking to, Christian, non-Christian, you know, Verizon or a church <laughs> or a bunch of pastors, people are people, problems are problems. <laughs> and uh, that's just the way it is. Yep. It doesn't matter. It's not like, well, it's totally different in the church. That's not true uh, because people are people. So, and I started to just notice that there were some common behaviors that would kind of rise up inside of someone and that behavior kind of in a toxic way gets inside of a team and really ultimately hurts the team, hurts the corporation. And, and again, from a church side, really hurts the church. We all hear of the word church split. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen because of a tender that happens because of a leader, mm -hmm. someone in a leadership influence position, they got a little toxic, that thing didn't get dealt with and it got worse and it got worse and it got worse and it destroyed the church or in business. It destroyed the team. It created toxicity. So it's just a matter of seeing it. I've also lived it. I'm a founding pastor myself. I have a coaching organization that's pretty large and I've seen it um, many times um, with people that I've had to work with. So. It's from my own experience and from watching other people re realizing there's six subtle behaviors that tear teams apart. And it doesn't matter what audience it is, it's the same behavior. And if it's not dealt with, it'll ultimately create uh, uh, damage in the organization. Yeah, so b before we get down to the uh, the role that I might play in, in these, if I'm not the leader of the organization, let's talk about the leaders a little bit because you start with something that you call leader drift. 
Yeah. What is that? Leadership. Yeah. Well, uh, well, I, I like to make up my own words. Uh, <laughs> my publisher's always like, man, you, you, you don't know how to spell very well. I said, well, this word I actually made up myself. <laughs> and it, 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 it's just when uh, leader drift is kind of taking two words, the word leader and the word drift and putting it together. And it's when an attitude or behavior causes a leader to start to drift. And we see that all the time in, in uh, um, churches. We see it all the time in, in corporations uh, where, uh, or in, in, in any relation really, but in leader drift is watching the attitude and behavior um, of individuals start to drift. And there is a biblical reference I, I, give, I give to that uh, leader drift. And that is, um, there is a guy named Moses in the Old Testament and he had a big old group following him. And one day he said, hey, I'm going to go up to a mountain and pray. You guys hang out over here. He goes up to a mountain and prays for six weeks. He comes back and they built a golden calf. It only took six weeks for, for his entire tribe that was going, yay God and yay Moses, our leader, to all of a sudden build a calf and say, no more God and no more Moses. Like only six weeks, that's all it took. And so the concept is that Vision is always leaking and people are always drifting. Mm. And as a leader, you have to constantly be pouring in vision, but you also got to be aware that your people are drifting and you've got to keep them moving, aligned and moving and going in the same direction. And so it's a matter of the attitude or behavior that causes a drift in a leader's heart from the, from the main leader and from the organization's vision. So that'd be more on the the followers or on the leader himself or is it kind of a i i think leader drift generally is more on the followers uh i think it's up to the leader to recognize the drifting gotcha to address it before it goes too far so mm, okay um uh, if there's uh organizations typically have to grow and maybe change with the times uh i mean just okay so the point at the church I mean, because we can see it in, I think, in the secular world, real clear, especially if you're in an area like communications or uh, technology, right? It's always changing. So you have to have some adaptation going on. Um, in a church, though, I, I do think, you know, you look at a church that is highly traditional in style and maybe in form, uh, organization, things like that. Some of them are struggling. And so the ones that are, tend to be, you know, a little more uh, successful, we would say, I guess, if we, if you just look at raw numbers, which is maybe sure. not the best metric, sure. um, they have more adapted. In other words, just to, just to put a face on it, they, you know, they have, they have a coffee shop and, and they have yeah. different groups for different people. You know, they've got a celebrate recovery group. They've, these are all relatively new inventions in a sense meaning that they've changed with the times. If there's a big need in your area for food distribution, you may see a church adapt that. I've been in a church that did that and it was a wonderful thing. So how do you how do you stay how do you not drift but yet stay with the times? Does that make mm. sense? Yeah, yeah, no, I hear what you're saying. Um it is a uh um I hear what you're saying because I see it. We see it a lot. There's a little over 70% of all churches in America are currently in decline. Hmm. Uh, and America shuts down anywhere from five to 10,000 churches per year, but we've got a lot of churches opening, but right now we're closing more than we open. And I think I say all that to say there is a problem there. You do have leaders that um, haven't adjusted. Right. Somehow they have to adjust their method without adjusting their message. Yeah. And um, yeah. we, we see that a lot. Um, either the leader isn't willing to adjust, the, the the board members, the key leaders aren't willing to adjust. And primarily, Randy, they don't adjust because they tend to choose preference over purpose. Oh, boy. I I want what I want. I don't know what the community needs, <laughs> but I want what I want. I don't, you know, the community might need this, but this is what I want. I want the worship to be like this. I want the service to be like this. I want it to feel like this. Well, that's great for you. No, that's not what the community needs. And then there's the threat when you start adjusting that people will start saying you compromise. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to deal with that. I, I find it real interesting that I've been to tons of third world countries doing mission work and just speaking or whatever. When, you, when I go to a third world country, like recently in Ghana, 
you you wear a suit and tie when you preach in their church. Yeah. I mean, that's just the way it is. You know, <clears throat> you, you've probably done that before. It's like, I don't wear a suit and tie anywhere, but it, but when you're in Ghana, you respect the culture and you wear a suit and tie. You don't go against it and say, well, I'm an American. I'm going to do what I want. That's just foolish. You adjust. You say, hey, do you want me to wear a suit and tie? I'll wear a suit and tie. Uh, but here's the thing. It's funny that when we go to a third world country and we adjust to the culture, we call that wisdom. When we do it in our own backyard, we call it compromise. <laughs> Well, and yeah, and and back to your point, if if the mission stays the same, you don't you're not compromising actual right. values. You may just right. be adjusting some maybe cultural sensitivities, but and that and that can be a fine line to walk at times. I, I it is. Understand. Yeah. It can be. It can be. But yeah, you do have to. I do think that you know, in specifics to church, that there has to be an adjustment. And it has to come from the, the key leader and the key key leaders to understand that preference has to win over purpose. Yeah. Or purpose has to win over preference. You've got to you've got to drive purpose over preference. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. That that's good. I like that. All right. Let's get to some of the behaviors. Uh, because yeah. this this list, um th- this list is not just recognizable, it stings a little bit. <laughs> like, oh, I've been there. Okay, done that. Um yeah. Pick pick up on one of these that you want to discuss and, and let people see what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Well, the book is, as you know, serving uh, Saving Your Church from Itself. It's the subtitle that really gives it away, Six Subtle Behaviors That Tear Teams Apart. So, for instance, I think one of the, one of the, uh, one of the first ones mentioned as a subtle behavior, if you will, is the word pride. And here's what happens. You get an organization, we'll, we'll, we'll use a church as an example, uh, since we're on that subject, but again, it could be anywhere. You get an organization, and you get a, a church, um, and a little bit of pride starts uh, sinking in to one of the staff members. Maybe that staff member gets an opportunity to speak, you know, once a month or once every other month. <laughs> and then, And then a few of the people in the church maybe in an innocent way say you know we really love your speaking tom you know i mean pastor bob is a great guy but man when you speak there's just you know there's just really clear what whatever and oh it's just so scriptural and whatever it is and now tom allows that press to start feeding his ego a bit and pride starts to kick in and then when pride kicks in it starts to slowly show up as a subtle behavior maybe Maybe he doesn't feel, maybe he comes across like the lead pastor doesn't have as much to teach him anymore or some way the pride starts showing up. But if you're a follower, if you are, I say a follower, if you're an associate pastor and associate in any way at any organization, when you start thinking these thoughts, that's, this is when you know you're headed towards pride. Here's some thoughts. Things would be better if I was in charge. Yeah. That's a dangerous thought. Hey, um, I, I, I love the organization. I tolerate the leader. Mm. That's a huge sign that, man, you are heading towards pride. Hey, do whatever you want in the church or the organization. Just leave my department alone. Oh. When those three things, those statements at all have entered into someone's heart, they're headed towards pride. And we know even, I think, it, it, listeners that are not even a Christian probably have heard this verse, pride comes before a fall. Uh, and it's, it's about to happen. You're going to, you're heading towards the wrong path. It is. And, and what we do is we start thinking things about if I was in charge and, you know, and if I ran things, it would be more like this. And if I did this and they start having these little conversations with people in the organization or the church, and, and it starts feeding that things would be better or things would run better. Or things would be more godly or whatever it is if they were in charge. And it's just so interesting to me that we allow that to um, get inside of our lives and sort of take over. Uh, and when we do, we are heading down a path that is going to ultimately create destruction. So here's here's the challenge, I think, because I have literally, I've literally said that. <laughs> if I was in charge, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and I think we all have on some level, um, but he, here's, here's the tough part. I've been in a situation um, years ago outside the ministry where the leader was not was was not doing things right the, the you know the head person was you could tell that he was going to take the whole department down with him 
if he continued doing things the way that he was doing. And so you, we heard these conversations all the time. Man, he shouldn't be doing that. I can't. And, you know, you, well, yeah, I love the company, but, we, oh, our, the, our departmental leader, I, I am just tolerating him. Uh, and if I was doing it, here's how I would do it better. Uh, how, when do those become, are those always dangerous pride? Or is there some level of learning from the negative uh, and maybe trying to do something to make the situation better without, I don't know, but because I, I, that, that's a tough one at times. And I know you've seen yeah. this. Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Um, because is there a healthy point of things we've got to fire in charge? Um, is there a healthy point, maybe not in that phrase, but in the sense of, hey, can I make the organization better? And I think it's a matter of motive and a matter of heart. If it's as long as the loyalty and the heart is towards the leader, um, it's like you might internally think, if I was in charge, I would do things way different. I don't think anybody has never thought that before. Everybody's thought that before. Okay. Boy, if I was in charge, I would do things different. And that's okay. And you can, it's the heart and the spirit. I'm going to, I think, I think things would be better if we did it this way. So I bring it to the person, to the leader. Mm -hmm. If the leader's like, great idea, and we all run with it, wonderful. If the leader's, nope, we're not going to do that, how do I respond? Yeah. How right. do I react? Right. It's the heart. It's the spirit. We must remember that it is never our job to replace what God put in place. Ooh. That's that's his doing. That's not ours. And if we try to secretly maneuver a situation so that maybe we can gain some authority, and that's a dangerous place. So bringing ideas, bringing solutions. Hey, man, if I was in charge, I think I would do it this way. Great. Bring it to the person. It's how you choose to respond. It's your heart and spirit in all of it that matters the most. And I tell crowds that I speak to that I know 90% of them aren't the leader of the organization. I always say, if you want, if you want uh, more chances to lead over, serve better under. Uh, yeah. And watch what happens. Uh, be the person that you would want other people to be when you're in charge. And that's powerful. And that, that is, yes, I, I have been there too. And, and that, that is, that does require humility. And sometimes it requires, Ooh, and this is a tough one too, because it requires not doing things the way that you think necessarily they should be done, which can feel like compromise. Yeah, it can, it can. I think the compromise comes down to ethics and morality. Yeah. Um, but if you're compromising a strategy or you're compromising a, an initiative or you're, well, a strategy, an initiative, a process, a way of doing things, I don't know if that's a compromise that I would call uh, that's right and wrong or, again, ethical or moral. It's just I would do it that way. I would, I would package it this way. They're going to package it this way. I would do that program this way. I'm going to bring that to that leader, but he's going to, if he decides to do it my way, great. If he doesn't, that's okay too. So a like guy would say, be stubborn with the vision, flexible with the plans. Cause at the end of the day, we're probably all somewhat headed to, in the somewhat right direction, but the way I would get there and the way that my leader would get there might be a little bit different. I don't know if it's necessarily compromised when it comes down to, again, strategy processes, systems. Uh, hey, I would run this program that way. If it gets down to ethics and morality, that's a different story. Yeah. A okay. Game. Yeah. So maybe in the church, it would be the difference between, uh, you know, the pastor is going to embrace something that's completely unbiblical and you're not 100%. on board with that versus, uh, you know, we're going to sing hymns instead of modern worship. And I really think modern worship is more effective and better and yada, yada, yada. 100%. Yep. It could be yep, that or, uh, hey, man, if I was in charge, we'd be doing more for the homeless around here. We don't do enough. We should do more. Okay. But you're not in charge. Uh, so <laughs> do what you can. Bring your ideas and that's fine. Now you start talking about morality and right. ethics and he wants you to sell everything and move to the mountains and sing Kumbaya with you. You might want to draw a line. But, uh, yeah. but, but outside of that, if it's just like modern worship versus not so modern worship or we should be verse by verse versus topical or we should be more like this and less like this, that's, that's the leader's choice. Uh, and we have to support that choice. We bring ideas, but then we have to support it. And when he says, he or she says no or yes, then we 
say, okay, and then we just have a great attitude and move on. It's all about the attitude, keeping that attitude in check. Yeah, and do you think, it, is there a level of, of honoring those that are in charge that God honors even when we think it could be done better? Yeah, I think so. You know, I think you can look at, uh, yeah, from a Old Testament standpoint, again, I think listeners from all probably heard the name Saul or David somewhere in their life. Uh, great, great situation. David's in charge. David, David, David is told he's going to be in charge by God. He's going to be the next king. He's the man. Saul comes along, gets all jealous, wants to kill him. Uh, and then the ultimate scene, it's an amazing scene. Even if you're not a Christian, you should find it because it's like, you can't, it's a Netflix. I mean, it's a Netflix. I mean, <laughs> right. it's so good. <laughs> Think about it. David with his men are trying to run away and they're up in these mountains in Israel. He goes into a cave and then Saul comes marching through the same area with his and decides to go to the restroom, goes in the cave to go to the restroom, the same exact cave that Dave's hiding in, in the dark. Mm -hmm. And David's like, I could kill him right now. Yeah. And this whole thing would be over. He's the one that's trying to kill me, but he doesn't see me. Because, you know, like going to a theater, you go to a movie theater, it takes your eye, eyes a moment to adjust. Saul's eyes hasn't adjusted and David could have killed him. <laughs> but David didn't. Yeah. David didn't. Seven chapters later, Saul dies in a, in a battle. Yeah. But David didn't. Why? Because it wasn't his job to replace what God put in place. And God I, will do it when he wants to do it. I, I I know the tendency would be, you know, hey, God told me I'm going to be the leader. He's delivered Saul into my hands, yep. uh, and I I am going to remedy a bad situation right now. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's get on with it. But that is not, that's just not how it always works. And You know what is real interesting in that story too, Randy, is his men, David's men whisper to him, God has given you this moment. Oh, Can yeah. You, wait a minute. Your godly circle <laughs> is also telling you, take out the leader so that you can be in charge. Man, that cannot be a greater portrait of a an associate who's listening to the press and has to decide, yeah. am I going to do the right thing or listen to the press? Listen to the people going, this is your time. If you were in charge, you would be a better leader. Yeah. And David says, it is not my job. It is not my job to replace what God put in place. I'm going to wait for God in seven chapters later. And uh, I, I, whenever I speak about that in 15 seconds here, whenever I speak about that, I always say, I wonder if it went through David's mind because he did crawl across the floor. He was going to go kill him, but then he changed his mind. And that uh, because God got a hold of his heart. But I wonder if there was any like David fast forwarding to sitting on a porch when he's 105 years old and telling his grandchildren and sitting with his grandchildren and his grandchildren saying, you remember, Grandpa, when you killed Saul, when you got in front of God, when you got ahead of God, do you remember that, Grandpa? I wonder if he was thinking, I don't want to leave that kind of legacy. I want to leave the legacy that kept my heart right until the very end. And when God wanted me in charge, he put me in charge. Until then, I will serve this leader. Yeah. Or maybe David thought he didn't want to tell the story. Well, you see, here's how it happened. Saul had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and I just decided to take it. What a great warrior I am. <laughs> All right. He's going to the bathroom. I got him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, you know, that, that that's, that's a hard one for people. Uh, and But that uh, you're, that's so right. What you're saying is absolutely right. Okay. I'm going to show people the book. This is. Saving Your Church from Itself by Chris Songson. Um, you can go also to a website here. This is chrissongson.com. Uh, and if you want to go straight for the book, you can go savingyourchurchfromitself.com. And there's some little bonus materials, uh, maybe mention a little bit here. But uh, lots of resources available for you. But I, I want to hit another one because, you know, when we get into a situation where maybe the leadership we perceive is not as good as it could be, maybe in reality it's terrible. OK, mm -hmm. whatever. We're in a situation where it's just not it ain't working out, but we can't get out of the situation. Uh, one tendency that I have had um, and I've seen it in others so many times is I just go, OK, look, I'm going to show up, do my part. But I am otherwise disconnected from this train wreck, you know, of a team. Mm -hmm. Totally pull back, totally isolate. And you say that's not healthy either. Yeah. 
The isolation? Yeah. Isolating? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Well, because you're heading towards, one, you're heading towards a destructive path, and two, you've already decided that you are separating yourself and you are creating an isolation. Um, you know, I, I do give a biblical reference in there of the prodigal son. You know, he goes off, spends a bunch of money, comes back, and the older brother stays out in the in the land and won't come in and, into the party. Uh, why? Because he felt mistreated. Why did he isolate himself? Because mm. he felt mistreated? Because he felt like, why did this guy get this party? He started to isolate himself. And it's that isolation that created the bitterness uh, inside of him. Mm. So I do tell people, I, I what you just said, Randy, is a perfect example. Okay, you know what? I'm here at the organization. My family's here. We live in this community. But let's get real practical. My kids like the school. You know, right, I, right. I get paid pretty decent here. So, you know what, man, I'm going to put my nine to five in mm -hmm. and everything's going to be good, you know. And uh, but man, that's a dangerous place to get because you're isolating yourself and it's in isolation where bitterness sits in. Mm -hmm. It creeps in. And that's where it happened to the to the guy in the in that story of the prodigals, the older brother, the isolation creates bitterness it creates resentment it creates a uh, uh, i'm just doing my job and it ultimately is going to lead to a toxic behavior it may not start off that way it may actually start off pure like you know what i just want to do right by everybody so i'm just going to isolate myself mm -hmm. and i'm just gonna and that probably i mean maybe started off pure but in the end when you isolate yourself you're going to ultimately allow bitterness and resentment to sit in because you feel I'm mistreated or they don't listen to my ideas or I'm getting passed up on a promotion yeah. or, you know what, no, I'm just going to do my job and, you know, I don't, I'm not going to do an A, but I'm not going to do a C. I'll do like a B minus job and that'll be enough to keep me employed and I'm not putting in any extra time. Like, it's just a dangerous place to be because, again, it might start off decent. But that's why in the book it says six subtle behaviors. They're not blatant behaviors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're subtle. Yeah. Like, oh, he's isolating himself. Oh, it's no big deal. Oh, well, okay, it isn't a big deal today, but it will become a big deal soon. Yeah. You know, we, we see that in marriages all the time. Um, and I, I mean, it happens both men and women, but when the man is supposedly the head of the household in a Christian, you know, marriage, you see the women do that a lot. Uh, yeah. and, and it never, never ends well. What's the solution to that? Well, one, uh, well, I think the solution to all of them uh, comes down to um, being willing, in my opinion, it's if you're the follower, you're the person that's feeling this isolation or any of the six subtle behaviors. I think if you're that person, you need to admit it, you need to correct it in your heart, and you may need to have a difficult conversation. If you're the leader, Okay, I'm a lead pastor. I'm a leader of an organization. I recognize it in one of the associates or whatever. You need to have the difficult conversation. Hmm. You need to bring that person aside and just say, hey, I've been noticing. A year ago, you were all in. You were like, man, you were first to get here, last to leave. You were all in. But, man, it's changed. Hmm. And this is the way, Randy, whenever I'm dealing with conflict and whenever I teach on dealing with conflict, I always say, this is how you do it. Let's, And I'll, I'll give you a 10-second role play. Hey, Randy. Uh, I've been noticing, you know, you're a little more isolated than you used to be a year ago. You were like this, and now you're kind of like this. Or I've been noticing in staff meetings, it's kind of like this. And here's what it is. I was wondering if you, can you speak into that for me? Hmm. And oh. you stop. Listening? Are you suggesting listening? Yes. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> if you will seek to understand, and if you will just not spend 10 minutes relicking on all these things this person's done wrong mm -hmm. that may be right and just say i've been noticing a b and c in a very calm gentle voice mm -hmm. and after about 20 seconds of that you just say literally 20 seconds 30 seconds at the most i was wondering can you speak into that for me now here's what will happen randy they'll end up saying because i just did this a few weeks ago with a staff member and i said can you speak into that for me and they went on for 10 or 15 minutes and in the middle of it they said da, 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 yeah and i know i can have a bad attitude sometimes but da, 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 da. they went on for 10 minutes <laughs> can we go back to that phrase bad attitude <laughs> i'm telling you if you will slow down and just say i've been noticing a b and c i'm wondering if you can speak into it when they respond 
nine times out of 10, they'll say a phrase like bad attitude or man, my heart's been drifting or I've been, I've been dealing with bitterness. And then you're able to go back, you know, you said the word bad attitude. You said the word bitterness. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Now you're solving a problem they admitted to you right? rather than you telling them what the problem is. That's how you deal with, with any situation when you feel like there's that subtle behavior starting to show up. Have the tough conversation, but go there to understand. Let them talk. They'll end up saying something, and you build the conversation on that phrase that they said. Well, one thing I did learn is similar to that is that if I have an, something that I think should be done differently, or something that should be done that's not being done, or something that should not be done that is being done, if I go straight at the leader and just tell them that, hey, you're doing this wrong, it the defenses come up, it, it likely is the end of the conversation. But if I go into a conversation willing to listen, and yep. then maybe making some suggestions, if I can get that leader to come to the same conclusion that I've come to, and let them think it's their idea, let them think yep. that they just solved a problem that I, they, they'll thank me for helping to identify that problem so that they could make it better. Yeah. Um, but that requires humility. Uh, but, but if you can get, like you're saying, you, you're leading them to identify a problem and then solve a problem. And whether, you know, when it's in themselves, well, my gosh, you just became a good leader and yeah. instead of yep. someone who was just policing them or something. Yeah, one of my favorite coaches, from the past, John Wooden. Uh, I never saw him coach. I wasn't. I'm not. You know, it, it, was, it was years and years ago, UCLA. Uh, but um, he always said this. He said the secret of leadership is to go in there knowing what needs to be done and let the other person feel it was their idea. That's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> you do that, you'll win every time. Yeah. Okay. Who last, cares who idea? Yeah. And and but last question. If you yes, get, if you get in that meeting and it does not lead to the right direction uh is is that maybe the signal that, that you need to purposely separate the team now are you talking about are you the person that's bringing in the idea or are you the actual leader of the organization that doesn't I, know, right? I, you know i don't know i guess it could go both ways but from a leadership standpoint you got the authority to do that but so so say you say hey what's going on and they say yeah you know okay maybe i've had a bad attitude or maybe maybe they don't ever admit it but they basically just you know tear you apart and you realize okay whatever the the root of this is if it's pride or isolation or some of the other things we didn't hit a critical spirit division artificial you know some of these things that you identify if you see that it's not going to be rectified anytime soon is there i mean is that your clue maybe that that you need to make some adjustments because i, I, yeah, think, I, I think, think, think it's right to fire some people at times Oh, absolutely it is. I think we are, uh, I, I, absolutely. Um, I think if you are the associate, here's the thing. If you're the associate, the, the whatever, the staff member, not the main leader, if you're that person, you have a, you're feeling some issues in your heart, you talk to them about it, it doesn't seem to get resolved. Here's what I tell people all the time if you're in that seat. If you're in that second chair, this is what I say. Hey, if you can keep your heart right and your spirit right and be loyal, even though you maybe don't agree with a certain process or whatever, great. If you can't um, and you can't keep your heart right, eventually it will come out. So it's probably time for you to transition off the team and yeah. look, look elsewhere. Yeah. If you're the main leader and you've given that person a warning or you've given that person, you know, the conversation doesn't go well and you sort of sign and say, hey, I noticed it and I need it to change and you kind of get a little more direct. I usually have about two or three tough conversations, but they heat up and uh, heat up, not in the, in the, not in yelling, but in like more direct. Mm -hmm. And by the second or third one, it's like, look, it, it's clear that you and I are on different pages and more than one vision always creates division. God's called me to be the leader. He hasn't called you to be the leader of this organization and we're going in different directions. Let me help you find another place to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've seen that. And I've seen it actually turn out healthy for people. Yeah, it can. It can absolutely. I've had that happen where I was like, we're, we agree to disagree. And bro, we, we, I literally saw that, the guy I'm thinking of right now, saw him about three or four months ago at, our, at this event, three-day event. We ended up golfing together and hanging out. and It's no big deal. But we agreed to disagree and everything was fine. Yeah. Uh, that, that only, that only happens because you, you, you handle it correctly. 
you have to handle it. Matthew 18 says, go to your brother at once. Talk about it. We didn't get into that artificial harmony thing, but uh, that's one of the one of the six subtle behaviors. It's when we pretend that everything's okay. Mm. It's a it's a great phrase, artificial harmony, because those two words never go together. But it's but it's when we pretend everything's okay and it's not. I'm telling you, if you just pretend like everything is okay and it's not, it doesn't automatically fix itself. And if you keep waiting, like oh, I don't want to have that tough conversation. I don't want to have that tough conversation. Here's what I always say. Uh, because you don't want to have it, okay? And, and you know it's going to be difficult. And you know what? There might be some fallout or whatever. Pay now or pay later. But if you pay later, you'll always pay more. Yeah. Yeah. So deal with it now. If, if it's a tough conversation, what are you waiting for? It's not going to fix itself. And you're and if you wait another six months, okay, you're going to pay later, but you're going to pay more. Yeah. Well, these are very, very true things, and I'll, I'll testify to everything you've said because I've, I've seen it in church and outside of church and secular businesses, um, and it's not always easy, which is why your your instructions are very, very helpful. Yeah. Uh, do you Now, you say you, you, you speak a lot. If someone's like, man, I need this guy to come fix my situation, do you do that still, or do they just need to start with the book? Well, <laughs> uh, I'm glad you brought that up. They can they can go to my website, chrissongson.com. We have a coaching organization um, that you and I didn't talk about prior to the show, churchboom.org, churchboom.org. That is an actual coaching organization, and they can get – we've got 30 coaches on there that more than have to coach them or help them. And then you had mentioned the book, Saving Your Church From Itself. If they go to savingchurchfromitself.com, they can download a free six-session resource – absolutely free there uh and they can pick up the book at a discounted rate as well succession resource what what does that mean uh six sessions resource six so session i session. thought we were talking about how to how to find the next leader <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's six sessions study guide is really what six it is sessions. so it's, it's actually randy it's written to be a book that that uh, organizations go through as a team. Hmm. So they buy a book for the 10 people on their team and they download the six session work study guide uh, at saving your church from itself.com. And they go, they use the book and the study guide together and they kind of work on these issues together over a period of six to eight weeks. Yeah. Well, there you go. If you, if you watch this interview and you're like, Oh boy, this guy is just outlined several of the problems I'm living. Just go get the resources. My goodness. I mean, do something about it. Don't wait. Pay now or pay later, and you'll pay more later, like Chris said. Yes, you will. <laughs> so, uh, great resources. I appreciate that. Uh, and very, very interesting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to think about this conversation a little bit longer because there's some application. I mean, even even here in in a ministry, you know, yeah. we we have these we have things like this go on. I mean, I've I've seen it. I've been a part of it, and I yeah. probably will face it again. So. Very, very good information. I appreciate cool. it. Awesome. Yeah, it's an honor to be on the show. Thanks so much. Appreciate you guys hanging out. If you know somebody that can benefit, my goodness, hit share. Uh, and, you know, maybe send a message. Hey, <laughs> you know, especially if you're, you know, not in an antagonistic situation. But, hey, maybe this will help us help our church or help our business. Uh, great resources. Very, very, very helpful. So, uh, if you haven't liked or followed or subscribed, do that. Um, come back. There's more great interviews. Got lots of great stuff lined up. So again, I'll see you again next time here on Live Today. You're about to ask big. I'm believing God for favor in my life. Above all that I can ask.